I remember when I was growing up, our local music shop just had one beginner mandolin hanging on the wall. And as an aspiring young player with no other options available at the time, that's the mandolin I ended up getting. But now things have changed. There are so many entry level options online, just a click away. It can be pretty overwhelming for someone trying to find their first mandolin. And without being able to experience these instruments in person, how do you know which one is the best? Well, today we're gonna find out. I recently bought seven of the most popular beginner mandolins available online and turned the studio here into a virtual music shop so that you can try them out and see which one is right for you. We'll be going over the build quality and feel for each in detail. We'll be doing some tone tests and comparisons. And at the end of this video, I'll be ranking them all from worst to best in terms of sound, playability, and affordability. So be sure to stick around. For this comparison, we're just looking at the teardrop shaped A models with F sound holes as the more intricate F styles usually cost more. And these are pretty much the cheapest models that each of their respective companies make, but there is a wide price range represented here. Here's the lineup. So you can already hear a big difference in how these mandolins sound, right? But more on that in a bit. First, let's talk about setup because most of these mandolins needed a little TLC to sound the way that they do here. And depending on where you buy these instruments online, yours might come in better playing condition, but I just bought most of these on Amazon because I wanted to see what the wide majority buying experience would be like. And straight out of the package, all of these mandolins came with loose string tension. So many of the bridges had moved around causing intonation issues. Some came with foam or paper under the bridge that needed to be removed, and the washburn even came with the bridge packaged separately. That's really not great for a beginner. Beyond needing to be intonated, some required more serious setup work. The worst defenders being the cheapest three, the Van Goa, Ibanez, and Recording King, all of which needed bridge resanding to fit the tops better. And on top of that, the Ibanez, Recording King, and the Lure all took truss rod adjustments to get rid of some mid fretboard buzz. I also ended up lowering the string action at the bridge on all of them to get them more to my liking and to get them playing as similarly as possible for this video. By far the easiest to set up were the more expensive Eastman and Kentucky mandolins, and the Kentucky was the only one to come with the bridge already in the right place for intonation. And all of that to say, if you don't feel comfortable doing some of these setup steps on your own, then definitely factor for a trip to the luthier in your instrument budget because a good setup will hugely affect your experience with these mandolins, especially the cheaper ones. So all of these mandolins are mass produced in factories overseas, and I was curious to see if there would be much of a difference in build quality and feel from one to the other. And surprisingly there was, and even more so, the price tag didn't always reflect that quality. First up, let's check out this Van Goa Basic VMA-10. I'd actually never heard of this brand before, but at the time of making this video, it was the best selling and highest rated mandolin on Amazon. It was also one of the cheapest mandolins I could find online at $119.99. So, I figured this would be a good control for our comparison. When this thing arrived, it came with a crazy amount of accessories. It was one of the only mandolins besides the more expensive Kentucky and Eastman to actually come with a carrying case. But not only that, it also came with a strap, an electric tuner, a set of picks and extra strings. And it also came with this really interesting stick-on pickup transducer, which I'd never seen anything like before none of which any of the other mandolins came with. But the mandolin itself definitely feels cheaper overall, and the main culprit being the plywood top, back, and sides that this one has compared to the solid carved wood that you see on most mandolins. It has a slightly longer gourd-like shaped body compared to the more circular traditional A5, and another difference is the exclusion of a truss rod, the only one in the bunch not to have one. That paired with this bridge here, which doesn't go very low at all, and a buzzy pickguard 
made this one tough to set up and challenging to play. That sounds awful, right? <laughs> But the biggest build issue for this one is the intonation. Even though I got the bridge in the right place to intonate at the 12th fret, there are still some major tuning issues up and down the fretboard. For instance, I can get the fifth fret of the A string in tune with the open D, but then the seventh fret on the D string won't sound in tune with the open A. Or I can get the strings to sound in tune for an open G chord, but then it sounds very out of tune when I move to an open D chord. Tricky stuff to fix and unfortunately beyond my luthier expertise. I could go on, but for now, let's move on to this Ibanez M510 DVS mandolin priced at $169.99. Ibanez is well known for their guitars, but I'd never played one of their mandolins before, and this model here seemed like another popular choice for beginners, so I was curious to see how things felt. And right from the start, you can see some similarities to the Van Gogh, with the longer body shape, the cheaper chrome tuners, and plastic pickguard, but with a couple improvements, including a slightly better bridge for lower action, and a truss rod allowing for a thinner neck and less intonation issues across the fretboard. Little bit of a sad story with this one. When I bought this online, the listing said that it had a select spruce top, which I took to mean solid spruce, but when this one came in, I realized that it's just a laminate spruce, another plywood mandolin, but at least this one has mahogany back and sides. But moving forward, the rest of these mandolins all use solid wood, starting with this Recording King Dirty 30s mandolin, coming in at $199.99. And Recording King is a company that specializes in making affordable acoustic instruments like banjos, guitars, and resonator guitars. But this was my first time playing one of their mandolins. Here we have a solid spruce top complete with maple back and sides. And the body shape is a bit different than the Van Gogh and Ibanez, but it's still not a traditional A5 with a wider top and more shallow sides on this mandolin. The neck has a bit more of a rectangular profile, but it's still very slim and easy to hold. And the appointments are a little bit stripped back with this hazy satin finish and minimal binding, but the working parts here are noticeably improved. These Ivoroid button tuning machines are so smooth compared to those chalky feeling chrome ones, and the bridge is a more standard sturdy build. I just had a little buzzing issue with the tailpiece, so I took the cover off to temporarily fix the problem. This is also the only mandolin here to have a full Florida extension on the fretboard, but there are no frets and it's not scooped, so it may not make much of a difference at the end of the day. Next up, priced at $249.99 is the Washburn M1S from their Americana series. In the late 1800s, the Washburn company was actually the largest mandolin maker in America, and they're still a popular choice today. This one's a similar body shape profile to the Recording King, but it's a bit deeper on the sides. And again, here we have solid spruce for the top and maple on the back and the sides as well. Chrome tuning machines again on this one, but these seem to work better than the ones on the Ibanez and the Van Gogh. Otherwise, this one has, I think, the fanciest appointments of them all with this heavy gloss varnish, with the ornate binding around the headstock, the neck, and the body, as well as a fairly quality pick guard. But for some reason, this one also has the thickest neck out of all of them, even with the truss rod being present. The last three mandolins here might be the most similar, all having the more traditional A5 shape that's more common for A models, specifically in bluegrass music. Starting with this Lore LM110 BRB Honey Creek mandolin, coming in at $2.99. The 
Lore Company exclusively makes mandolins and guitars. And even though this Honey Creek has some less flashy features than the Washburn, I think you can see a noticeable increase in craftsmanship with this mandolin. Spruce top, maple back and sides again, but this one also has a beautiful red tinged fretboard made of paddock wood that really complements the immaculate reddish sunburst and smoky satin finish here. The fingerboard on this one is a little bit wider than the rest of the mandolins, but the neck still feels comfortable. And we even have a slight V profile on this one, which is more common in higher end mandolins. Also at the bottom of the neck, we have a more traditional dovetail connection instead of the neck just being bolted on like some of the previous mandolins that we've had here. Also at the top of the neck, we have a bone nut instead of plastic like we've seen so far. On to the Kentucky, which is owned by the parent company Saga Musical Instruments. This is the KM150, and I found this new online for $529.99. Kentucky also has a very slightly cheaper model called the KM140, which looks almost identical to this one here. The only difference being the use of laminate back and sides instead of solid maple like this one has. But for less than $100 more, I opted for the KM150 because this all solid wood mandolin is often held up as the gold standard for tone in the beginner mandolin market. And this thing really does look great. You know, we're back to some more intricate appointments again, but they're all done in a more subtle fashion here, similar to what you'd see on more expensive high-end mandolins. The gloss finish is a thinner, natural looking varnish that brings out the darker tones on this beautiful orange sunburst. The pickguard is the nicest we've seen yet with no screws showing on the top at all. And these vintage style tuners are the smoothest and easiest to use out of all the mandolins here. Over on the neck, we have a bone nut again, but down here at the connection, we're back to a modified dovetail like you see on some of the cheaper mandolins. Also, the neck is a little bit thicker and more round than I was expecting, but it's still comfortable to hold. And to top it off, this one also comes with a very well padded faux leather gig bag for carrying. Lastly, we have this Eastman MD305, which is the most expensive of the bunch, coming in at $619. But in my experience, Eastman seems to be the most common choice for beginner mandolinists in the bluegrass world because Eastman is known for their vintage style, tone, and construction. I will say surprisingly, this one looks very similar to the Lore, but we may have even taken a step back in appointments with this dark monochrome finish and the exclusion of binding on the back. But there are some positive functional differences here, like the addition of this one piece tailpiece, a slight extension on the fretboard and deeper sides for more resonance. Also, this is the only mandolin in the batch that has a radius fretboard, you know, a slight curve to make it feel more comfortable with the contour of your fingers, which I do like. And this might be the nicest neck out of all of them. It just feels very slim, but also substantial with that slight V profile this one has. Of course, this is all solid wood again. We have a spruce top, maple back and sides. We have a bone nut and a dovetail neck connection to boot. This one also came with a black cloth padded gig bag and a certificate of authenticity, which is nice. Well, that is a lot of specs. So let's get on to the fun part now. How does the tone and playability of these mandolins compare, especially in such a wide price range? We're gonna do some tests to find out, but first, here's a word from our sponsor. If you're just starting out on the mandolin and you're looking for a comprehensive guide on how to actually play this thing, then check out the complete beginner's guide to mandolin that we have here on the channel. It's a 17 part video series that starts from the ground up where you'll learn melodies, chords, even a little music theory, all the while adding some popular songs in the bluegrass and old time traditions to your repertoire. And the best part is it's free. You can actually watch all the lessons right now in order at the playlist link up at the cards above. But if you'd like to support the channel further and see more crazy videos like this happen, then please consider joining our 
Patreon community as well. There are so many extra learning resources over there, including literally hundreds of tab transcriptions and MP3 recordings for all playing levels to help you work towards that next step in your mandolin journey. There's a link below if you wanna check it out and huge thanks to all the patrons who are already over on the site. We just hit 2,500 recently, which kind of blows my mind and we could not have done this video without your generous support. So thank you. But back to the exciting part, we're gonna hear these mandolins back to back to see just how different the tone really is. And to remove any sound variables here for these tests, I've restrung all seven mandolins with the same D'Addario Phosphor Bronze EJ74 medium strings. I'll also be using the same pick, a Blue Chip CT55 1.4 millimeter pick, and recording straight into a pair of KM184 Neumann microphones with flat EQ. So here we go. Let's start off by hearing some open chords. Next, for you bluegrassers out there, you can tell a lot about how a mandolin sounds by the bluegrass chop. Check it out. To test the volume and the tone of these mandolins, here's some heavy downstroke playing in the style of Monroe. Check it out. How about some double stops now? Take a listen here. Sometimes these mandolins respond differently up the neck as well, so here's a lick high up there to see what it sounds like. All right, the proof is in the pudding, and now it is time to rank these mandolins. But let me say first that any mandolin is better than no mandolin when you're getting started. But there definitely are some options here that I think will serve you better as you learn this instrument. So forgive any negativity here as we get into the details. This is my list from worst to best, and I'll also give each mandolin a score out of 10 so you can see how these line up more clearly. And you may have guessed it, coming in last place at number seven is the Van Goa. And um, I think it's safe to say after this comparison that the plywood construction really does affect the tone negatively. That combined with the setup issues we had here and the intonation made for a pretty poor playing experience overall. I think it's pretty amazing that you can get a mandolin for 120 bucks, especially one with so many accessories Series, but I don't think that makes up for the poor build quality and sound here, earning the Van Goa a score of two out of 10. Close behind the Van Goa at number six is the Ibanez. While this one looks a little nicer and the addition of a truss rod, slightly better bridge and passable intonation made this one more feasible to play, it still really wasn't that enjoyable to play. The plywood top, the harsh metallic tone and some setup issues really took a toll here for a three out of 10 score. And if you're looking for a budget mandolin, I think the improvements at the $200 price tier really warrant an extra 30 bucks or so. At number five here, things get a little interesting. After the Ibanez, I would place the Washburn next for a six out of 10 score. 
This was the first mandolin on the list to really feel like a real mandolin. You know, the response was very nice and even up and down the neck, and the volume was maybe the loudest out of all seven. But there were a few things I felt held this one back. First, the tone, there's a lot of clarity there, but it almost sounded a little bit metallic with not as much woody complexity as I'd like to hear. Also, aesthetically, this one's not my favorite with the yellow finish and some of the more gaudy appointments like the unusual headstock, the heavy gloss, and the triple binding. To me, it almost makes the mandolin look a little bit cheaper for some reason. But the real clincher was this heavy neck. It's so thick, I felt like I was holding a baseball bat instead of a mandolin. And for $50 less, I'd probably go with this Recording King, which comes in at number four on my list for a seven out of 10 score. While this one definitely is not the nicest looking mandolin, I found it very easy and enjoyable to play. The tuners are smooth, the neck is nice and slim, and while it's not as loud as the Washburn, I felt like there is more of a thunk behind every note for a more natural, old-timey vintage tone. I actually found myself quite enjoying this mandolin as I was making this video, and uh, you know, there were some setup issues at the beginning, and it may not have the perfect tone for bluegrass if that's a concern for you, but at only $200, I'd have to give this Recording King the best budget mandolin award. It's a great option that's really cheap if you wanna get your feet wet. But on to the last three, and it may be no surprise that the more expensive traditional A5 models made it to the finals, since there is a definite increase in quality here. And coming in third place is the Lore for a 7.5 out of 10 score. You know, I had really high hopes for this one when I unboxed it because it looks and feels amazing, especially for that price tag. And for the most part it is, you know, there's a focus woody quality to the sound and it feels like you can really dig in without the mandolin complaining, which makes this a perfect option for a bluegrass beginner. The only thing holding this one back is the volume. For some reason, this one is the quietest out of all these mandolins, making the tone feel a little bit thin and nasally and the strings a little bit tighter on the right hand, especially on the higher strings. But that's a factor that could change over time as this mandolin is played in. It's still for 300 bucks, this is a fantastic starter mandolin. And in my books, it gets the best value award out of all of these. Which brings us to our final two mandolins. Drum roll, please. Coming in at number two is the Eastman for a score of eight out of 10. You know, I was actually pretty surprised to find this one feeling and sounding so similar to the lore, but costing over twice as much. And I actually think that the lore looks nicer, but the Eastman does come out on top in terms of playability and sound. The radius fretboard in the neck feel very nice on this one and the sound is noticeably louder. But also similar to the lore, I felt like the Eastman tone was a bit nasally and closed over and the strings tighter than I'd like. Don't get me wrong, this is a great beginner mandolin that outperforms most of the mandolins here, including the lore, but for what you get, I'm not sure it warrants the dramatic increase in price. And for less money, and in my view, an even better beginner mandolin, I'd recommend the Kentucky KM 150 coming in at number one on this list for a nine out of 10 score. My whole experience with this mandolin has been quality, from the unboxing, to the setup, to the playing, and this thing looks, sounds, and feels like a mandolin well beyond the beginner price tier. The tone sits between clarity and complexity so well, and I never felt like I was fighting the instrument to get it to do what I wanted it to. My only complaint is the neck being a little bit thicker than I'd like, but otherwise this mandolin takes all the boxes for me, and I think it's an instrument that would last someone many years, well into the intermediate level, and for a reasonable price, earning this Kentucky the best overall beginner mandolin award, in my books at least. And obviously this is all just my opinion, right? There's so much nuance to acoustic instruments. Certain mandolins are gonna connect with some people more than others. And if you felt differently about these mandolins, I'd love to hear your ranking order in the comments below. And I really do hope this was a helpful resource in weighing up your options for a beginner mandolin, but this is really just the beginning. As you get into higher and higher price tiers for more bespoke handmade mandolins, the quality changes even more dramatically. And if you're curious as to how some of these beginner mandolins hold up against my main Apidius mandolin, an instrument valued at over $10,000, then stick around because that video is coming up next.